There's a sling in my voice And a stone in my praise Pushing back when the darkest weapons form And there's a power on my lips Even death can defy When the name of our God is lifted high Cause there is resurrection power Sing the name of Jesus, resurrection power. When we raise a mighty sound, so come and let the praise get loud. Make that into grave, raise now. Cause there is resurrection power in his name. And there are days I have seen filled with heart. Resurrection. 
There is no shadow that has ever overcome your light. And there is no rival that could ever stand against your might. You've always been with us. Every battle you've already won. No, we've already won. Good afternoon, folks. Man, I am so glad that all of you are here. Can I ask your help with something? Yes. Now, you all know how frustrating it is on Sunday when all your cheap church people come and scatter around the auditorium. So help me out. We want to help Glenn. Move. If we can, let's try to move to the center areas, maybe these three sections. Can I inconvenience you and just ask for your help on that? That would sure, uh, sure help us out. If we can kind of maybe this section, this section, and this section kind of confine uh, things, move in. I am so glad that all of you are here. Did you have a good lunch? Man, I am looking forward to what the Lord's going to do uh, tonight. We, um, how many of you were at last year's conference um, in uh, Utah? How many of you were there? We did something we've never done before. Um, it was called Rothentic. We picked uh, five subjects that nobody wants to talk about in the ministry. We asked five experts to give a five-minute TED Talk on that, and then we, get, we had you do questions around the table. It was incredibly popular. I couldn't believe the feedback we got. And uh, everybody talked about Glenn Lutyens. And Glenn was, he actually presented two of the five uh, topics. And one of the pastors came up to me after and said, man, that Lutchens guy, I just feel like I want to tell him every problem I've ever had. 
So I said to Glenn, Glenn, we are going to have no breakouts. We're going to give you exclusive access. Uh, everybody wants you back. Uh, he is with Focus on the Family, very gifted counselor, uh, has a burden, understands uh, ministry, and has helped us on many occasions through COVID. We did some uh, we did some mass counseling through video and things, but he just has a great heart. And I want you to give a warm Rocky Mountain welcome to Glenn Lech as he comes. Will you do that? Appreciate it. Well, thank you. So good to be with you. It's an honor and a a pleasure to be with you here today. Right now, I can relate to a comment that is often mentioned uh, at Focus on the Family in the counseling department. My brother, not physical brother, but spiritual brother. George Stanky is here. George is one of our pastoral counselors. And I have failed to introduce my wife, Elizabeth Lutchins. And uh, she is probably my greatest cheerleader. Thank you for being here today, hon. Um, But one of the comments that's often made when people come and do devotionals is how intimidating it is when they're doing this devotional for 14 or 16 counselors that are there. But I do believe God has put some things on my heart that I'm excited to share with you. I hope that the words of an old poem, you may have heard it before, maybe not. It's an old poem, doesn't come true. It's called an ode to a, to a preacher. It goes like this. I never see my rector's eyes. That's a, another word for pastor. I never see my rector's eyes. He hides their light divine. For when he prays, he shuts his own. And when he preaches, mine. So hopefully that won't happen in our time here today. I'm a counselor by training um, and profession. I work at Focus on the Family. I'm in the counseling department. I'm not here representing Focus today, but I have a few things that I want to share with you that you can connect in some ways if you would like. Um, I also have a private practice uh, as well. I'm a licensed marriage family therapist. And I've been here now in Colorado for 27 years. Uh, My wife and I moved out in 1995 with, at that time, two children since I've had a third, and all of them are young adults now, uh, but it's been a a real pleasure being here. Uh, I did have some experience in pastoral work. I was an associate pastor for a couple years back in New Jersey at Pascac Bible Church in Hillsdale, New Jersey. And so I did that for a few years. I was counseling, and I was also doing some pastoral work. I would say I was doing 60% counseling, about 60% pastoring. So it was... uh, It was pretty busy, kept me going. Gene asked me if I would share today on five ways to guard your emotional well-being in ministry. At first, as I was thinking about it, I was scratching my head. I was saying, boy, I I really need to come up with the right five. But then I realized I could use sub points and I could probably do about 10 or maybe 15. So we'll we'll get quite a few in. Some of you may be familiar with a gentleman by the name of Vince Lombardi. Vince Lombardi was a coach, NFL coach. He coached for the Green Bay Packers. Yeah, let's hear it for the Packers. What's interesting is he coached for nine years as a head coach. Five of those nine years, he won the NFL championship. That's pretty good. That's more than 50%. I wish my team had 25%, but uh, they don't. But what's interesting and something that you may not be familiar with is that the team, the Green Bay Packers, for the 11 years prior to Vince Lombardi coming as head coach, every single one of those 11 years, they had a losing record. So that's quite a turnaround to go from 11 losing records to five out of nine championships. But it was said of Vince Lombardi that when he would have spring training um, and, and the team would gather together, they would come in and he would hold up something. Anybody know what it was? It was a football. And he would say, gentlemen, this is a football. And he would start with the foundational basics and he led his team to five NFL championships in nine years. 
And those foundational basics are sometimes things that are easy to drift from. And I want to share with you these five different aspects, these five different ways of guarding your emotional well-being to help you stay on track, to stay excited about the opportunity in the ministry that the Lord has given you. Let me pray with you as we start. Lord, we're here today because of you. You've made us in your image. You have pursued our hearts through your spirit. Lord, we pray that your spirit right now will fill each one of us, fill me, fill each individual here. By your grace, Lord, that those areas that are important for us to learn and grow, that there would be an excitement about you, that there would be an excitement about emotional well-being, and that by your spirit, you would touch our hearts in those areas that are most important in our lives. To, to bend our knee to you, to yield to your spirit, and to be guided by you. We ask this in the precious name of Christ our Savior. Amen. Number one, guarding your well-being through honesty, through honesty. It's a simple concept, just be honest. It's really helpful for those of us who our memories are going a little bit, because if you're not honest, you have to remember what you told someone before. But honesty is important. And, and yet the father of lies and his cohorts would try to get us off track as it relates to honesty. I want to share with you just a brief segment of Genesis chapter 3, verse 6. It goes back to the garden. Honesty or dishonesty at that point started very early on. And so the first area of honesty is honesty with yourself. Genesis 3, 6. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was a delight to the eyes, and that the tree was desired to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate, and she gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate. There are three things that we know were going on in the mind of Eve. Now, it had to be supernatural, because the author of Genesis, Moses, wasn't there. But there are three things that she was aware of. One was that it was good for food. Secondly, that it was visually appealing. Now, my wife has helped me out a bit as it relates to food being visually appealing. When I make a salad, I put in lettuce, green beans, and green peppers sliced up, okay? So she's helped me. She's got a little bit more color in there. We get uh, some tomatoes. We get some yellow peppers. We get some red peppers, some carrots. So we get some color that are present. But visually appealing, apparently, to Eve. The third thing was that it would make one wise. Now, you need to keep in mind that the serpent, Satan, spoke to Adam and Eve. And what was his lie? That if you eat of this tree, if you eat the fruit of this tree, you will become wise as God. We're told three things that she was thinking about. What was missing? What God had told them. Don't eat of this tree. And so she kind of filtered that out in her process of thinking and she made a decision based upon that. It was the biggest mistake that has ever taken place in this world. And so we need to be honest with ourselves and it's so easy to be tempted to not look at the whole truth, not to look at what God says to us. I'm reminded of a few rationalizations that I've heard in my life one of them was a young woman who was speaking to her sister and her sister was pregnant, but her sister was not married. 
And so this person who was speaking with me just shared that uh, she was talking with her, and I think gently was just kind of challenging her sister. And her sister's comment was this. She said, yeah, well, I'm pregnant, but so was Mary. Okay, and she's not talking about Mary, her neighbor. She's talking about Virgin Mary. The rationalizations that are easy to do. There was one gentleman who decided to go on a spiritual fast. So he made a decision. I, I'm, I'm not going to eat at McDonald's. I don't know if it was during Lent or whatever, but he decided he wasn't going to eat at McDonald's. So as he was in the car with this other individual, he said, hey, hey, can you pull into to that store there? I want to get something at Wendy's. <laughs> not really what we would say is wise when you're trying to fast from McDonald's. I mean, Wendy's would probably be a close second. And yet, I think when it comes to our relationship with the Lord, our rationalizations are like the, you know, so was Mary, or pull into Wendy's. God knows our rationalizations, how tempting it can be to take what we want and make that what we're saying God says. But it's also important to realize what we need to be honest about. We need to be honest about our brokenness, our brokenness. In Luke eleven thirteen, 13, Jesus says, if you then, and he was talking to his disciples, a group of other people who were kind of interested in what he had to share. If you then, who are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your heavenly father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask. And I can kind of imagine what it might have been like at that time where you had these group of people and they're hearing about Jesus saying that the Holy Spirit can be given, but there are three words that I'm not sure they were anticipating. After Jesus said you, he said, who are evil? And I could just imagine some of them kind of looking around like, is he talking about you? He's not talking about me. I mean, me, evil, no. And yet Jesus doesn't say it in a condemning way. He doesn't say it in a way of putting them down. He's just honest about the fact that we are broken people who need the grace of Jesus Christ. I think back in my childhood, I didn't have a, you know, into drug abuse and came to Christ. Actually, I was raised in a Christian home but I think back to my brokenness as a child and I was just kind of thinking back about this recently as I was preparing for this. And I remember, I think it was second grade, it was Sunday school class and I brought a, I brought a pocket knife with me. Now I didn't use it on anyone, but I think I showed it to someone and one of the individuals in the choir kind of kindly took me to one of my parents uh, because I had that. But I remember a time when I was in high school and probably one of the prof most profound moments of my brokenness, there have been others too, but this one really struck me. I was in a high school musical my senior year and we were deciding how to uh, prepare to do the curtain call at the end. And I remember there were two things that I wanted. One of them was, I wanted my own curtain call. I wanted to come out by myself. The other was, I wanted a crescendo. That's pretty bad. That's my brokenness. Now I can look back and say, well, that's gone. That was how many years ago, 40 years ago or whatever. But my brokenness is still there. Every once in a while when I'm caught in a traffic jam, I have this thought that maybe just up ahead, there's a, there's a fender bender. And if there is, then, I mean, I don't want anybody getting killed, but if there's a fender bender, then we'll get through this a whole lot quicker. I'm thinking about me at that moment. I have no thought about anyone else. Would I want them to hope that I was in the fender bender? No, but I was thinking about me. Now, before you write me off, how many of you football fans have a deep sense of sorrow and remorse when the opposing quarterback has to limp off the field, okay? Probably not too many of us, you know. It's, there's brokenness in each one of us, and it's acknowledging what goes on in our lives and how we need to bring it before the Lord. I think of a quote by C.S. Lewis. 
C.S. Lewis said, hell is for those who think they're good. It's for those who know they're not. And again, it's not about condemnation. It's not about, oh, I have to feel so terrible about me. It's simply acknowledging the truth that I'm a broken man or I'm a broken woman and I need Jesus Christ. One of our campuses at our church is a correctional facility, a prison. And so periodically I'm down with the men. I'll tell you one thing I have never seen so much. When I go down and the guys come in, there is a smile on their face. There is an excitement to see part of the church body from Colorado Springs there. I mean, they, everyone wants to shake my hand, you know, and not just me, it's the other volunteers that are coming down as well. But there's an excitement there. But when they sing the song, my chains fell off, I've been set free. These are men who are excited. These are men who feel the truth of that. Even though there's a wall behind them, there's wire, they can't get out. But spiritually, God has done a work in their heart and in their life. When we forget what our need is, our well-being is in grave danger. Honesty with yourself. Secondly, honesty with God. So what happened when Adam and Eve ate? It says they went and they hid. They weren't coming for God. They weren't saying, hey God, here's what we did. No, they went and they hid. But God came looking for them. God came and pursued them. And so we find in Genesis 3.11, God said, who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten of the tree that I commanded you not to eat? As if God didn't know, right? Have you eaten of the tree that I commanded you not to eat? The man said, yes, yes, I did. No, that wasn't his response. The man said, the woman whom you gave to be with me, she gave me fruit of the tree and I ate. There wasn't an honesty with God. There was, a, there was a denial, there was a blame, not only blaming her, but he's blaming God too. I mean, you gave her to me, so it's not my, not my bad, not my fault. But that honesty with God about what we are, who we are, what we struggle with, as if we can hide anything from God. <laughs> It's kind of, it reminds me of the, the child who's playing hide and seek and, you know, they're getting close to, you know, the number that comes up and now the person's going to come seek them. You know, and they close their eyes and they cover their face and they think they won't be seen. I mean, obviously that's not the case. And yet we tend to do the same thing with God. At the time when we need to be the most honest, at the time where we may be tempted or struggling the most, we need God's presence the most is when we tend to become quiet in our talk with him. I think of Psalm, uh, the Psalms, David and other Psalmists. In some of their most deep struggling times is when they're the most honest with God. And that's what God wants in our lives. And thirdly, honest with others. Oh, I can't share that. Well, why not? Well, I'm a pastor. I'm a, I'm a youth leader. I'm a church administrator. I, I can't do that. Oh, yes, you can. I think there are four reasons why people tend not to be honest with others. One is fear of rejection. If I tell you this, you will reject me. And I, I can't have that. I need your acceptance. I need your approval. I, I need to have you not reject me. And there's a second that's a close tie to it. And that is our fear of embarrassment. Our fear of embarrassment. If there's a struggle that we're going through, we don't want to look bad. We don't want to be embarrassed. So we tend to, we tend to keep it in. Thirdly, I think, is a fear of accountability. A fear of accountability. If I tell you what I'm struggling with, if I tell you what's going on in my heart, there's a good chance that if you're concerned about me 
at some point shortly down the road, you're going to ask me, hey, how are you doing? And I don't want to be accountable because then I probably have to deal with this. So it's easy not to share it, but to simply keep it hidden. And the fourth reason is we're not interested in the consequences. Sometimes there can be consequences to sharing what's going on in our lives. But generally speaking, when there are consequences, they may be consequences we need to face. If somebody is telling someone of a a sexual inappropriateness, have you spoken to your wife? Have you spoken to your husband? Well, no. Okay, that probably needs to happen. And so the importance of being willing to face those consequences that are present in life. It was John Ortberg, a pastor at a church in Menlo Menlo Church in California. I remember hearing him talk about a time where he, I don't know if it was a counselor, I don't know if it was a pastor or mentor, I think it was a mentor, but where he wrote down everything he could remember about his life. The pretty, the ugly, the in-between, he wrote it all out. And he took time, I don't know how long it took him to share it, but it was double digits of pages that he wrote. And he shared it with this person. And at the end of what he had shared, the person still accepted, still loved him. I think we have this idea that if I share what's going on in my life, you won't accept me. You won't love me anymore. And I think that's from the pit of hell. There's a French novelist Andre Malraux, who said, man is not what he thinks he is. He is what he hides. And it's real easy to hide a lot in our lives. I want to take you back just a little bit, give you a little bit of background in my life. I grew up in a Christian home. I mentioned that a little bit earlier. I grew up in a house that had been a barn. So 20, actually about 40 years before I was born, the house had burned down on the front lawn. So whoever owned the house at that time, it wasn't my parents, but they turned the barn into a house. So there was no level floor in the house. Uh, The kitchen table would kind of go like this. And if any of you know the game Stratomatic Football, a table that goes like this is real helpful to the person who's on this side of the table. Okay, not the person who's on this side of the table. That was probably my brokenness even early before my high school years. But it was, a, it was a big house. My parents had um, five children, adopted uh, a, a young girl from Korea when I was about 10 or so. My dad was a nurseryman and a landscaper. He was a pretty quiet man, but he was a man of faith. He loved the Lord. He loved my mom and showed kindness to her in, in many ways. My mom was an individual, probably one of the most unique individuals I can ever recall. Um, I cannot remember a day where I would come down to the kitchen table and my mom would not have her Bible, her commentaries, uh, that she was also, before or after she did her personal study, she was listening to Robert A. Cook from the King's College, Derek Prince, Focus on the family, uh, Charles Stanley, uh, different preachers. She loved the Lord. And my parents not only had this love for the Lord, but they lived out their life for the Lord. Not only did they adopt my sister from Korea, but there were also foster siblings. Over a course of probably about, I don't know, 20 years or so, there were maybe 30 foster children, different periods of time. Some might be for a weekend, some would be for a longer period of time. I think the longest was about five years, Mike Hoy, who was uh, a foster brother. We had refugee families from Afghanistan, from Laos, from Romania, that came and lived at our parents' house. There would be times I wouldn't know if my bed was going to be clear because there may have been somebody who came that needed a bed to stay, and my parents opened up their house to the person. So there was a deep joy about the Lord. I would say in some ways, it was kind of like a, a very ecumenical evangelical family. My parents were Lutheran, but there were people from Baptist, 
Assembly of God, Evangelical Free, all kinds of people that we interacted with over the years. And when I was about 10 years of age, I remember going forward at a Tom Skinner crusade and trusted in Christ. Now, I may have been a believer before that, but I know from that time forward, I had trusted in Christ. When I was about 13 or 14, I believe that God had called me to ministry. And so I was pursuing that. I went to a Christian college. I majored in history. And I was going to take one year off. I was going to work. And then I was going to go to seminary. So that was my plan. During that year, I went through probably the most horrific year of my entire life because I started struggling with faith. I was saying to myself, you know, I believe that there's a God, but there's a part of me that's just struggling with it. And I remember three particular conversations that I had that were extremely meaningful to me. One was a conversation with my parents. Now my parents couldn't identify with what I was sharing, but they accepted me in the midst of my struggle. Then I had a conversation with my older brother. My older brother was a pastor. And he shared a couple of words with me that at the moment were probably not the most enjoyable words to hear. But he said, keep thinking. Part of me didn't want to hear that because if I could have tuned my mind out, I would have done it. And the third conversation was with my brother Gary. My brother Gary is two years older than me. He and I, probably for the last 20 years or so, have every other Sunday, we call each other, we share prayer requests, we pray with each other. But that particular day, I was working at this woodworking shop. My brother actually is retiring from a woodworking shop this year. So he has the great woodworking ability. I was kind of the chief sander, but his ability was there. And I remember that particular day, I was, I went to the bathroom, I just started crying. And then on the way home, I just couldn't hold it anymore. And I started crying again. And my brother said to me, he said, Glenn, what's going on? I said, Gary, more than anything else in the world, I want to believe, but I just can't. And I will remember till my dying day what he said to me. He said, Glenn, I don't think of you as any less of a person or a Christian just because you're going through this. Now, he and I talked a bit after that about things of the faith. To be honest with you, I don't remember anything we said in that part of the conversation. But his acceptance saying, I don't think of you as any less of a person or a Christian just because you're going through this has been something that I I hold on to. In fact, I was sharing with him the other day that I was going to be sharing this at this meeting and I also had a tough time just keeping tears from my eyes because of how powerful it was. It took about a year working through that struggle I wanted God to write across the sky. And I realized that as a believer in Jesus Christ, I believe some pretty amazing, some would say far-fetched things. I believe that a baby was born without a human father. I believe that there were walls of water that stood straight up so that the children of Israel could go through them. I believe that people were raised from the dead by the power of God. Those are pretty amazing things. But you know what? (laughs) Every day you and I have to wake up to an even larger miracle that you and I are here and that this world is here and the complexity of what God has created. If you can explain that away, good luck apart from God. C.S. Lewis has been pretty influential in my life, probably to many of you as well, just the profound thinking of the gentleman. And there's a screensaver I have on this laptop. C.S. Lewis said, I believe in Christianity as I believe that the sun has risen, not only because I see it, but because by it, I see everything else. Nothing makes any sense apart from the power of a God who has created How do you make sense of love? How do you make sense of forgiveness? How do you make sense of morality apart from a God who has communicated himself to us? There's a particular story in uh, the Chronicles of Narnia. The Silver Chair is probably my favorite of the uh, Chronicles of Narnia books. And there's a scene where Jill is 
looking for water and there's this lion who kind of comes in between the stream and her and she asks Aslan to move away. <laughs> he says, no, I'm not going to. Well, will you, you know, will you, will you, will you harm me? Are you safe? You know, will you promise to do nothing? He says, no, I make no promise. And Jill, he, she, Jill finally says, well, then what I'll do is I'll go and I'll look for other water. <laughs> and Aslan says, there is no other water. This is the only water that will satisfy you. So she got up some courage and went and drank and had the most satisfying water that there was. Apart from God, you and I do not experience the most satisfying water that there ever was. And there were two verses that were extremely helpful for me. First Corinthians 13, verse 12. The apostle Paul says, for now we see in a mirror dimly, but then we're gonna see face to face. Here he is, one of the most profound, influential believers in Jesus Christ in all of history, saying, we see in a mirror right now dimly, but there will be a time that you and I will see face to face. Mark 9, 24. This was a story of Jesus healing the uh, father's son who threw himself into the fire. The man says, Lord, if you can, Jesus says, if I can, all things are possible to him who believes. And the man said this, he said, immediately the father of the boy cried out and said, Lord, I believe, help my unbelief. Boy, that was meaningful for me because I thought, you know, it's either I have to be all belief, never any doubts or just doubts. But what struck me was the majority of time in my life, belief is there and it dwarfs the unbelief. So there may be times that we struggle. In fact, I would say, I wish that, that I could mention that, you know, after that period of time in my early twenties, that was it, that's the last of the doubt. But I remember about 10 years ago, I was struggling. I kind of think of it as 10 days from hell, literally. And I shared it with my bride, Elizabeth, and she shared three words with me that totally nixed the doubt. Three words. Well, one of them was my name, so that leaves two for impact, okay? She said, Glenn, you're obsessing. And I thought to myself, <laughs> that is exactly what's going on. I gotta believe, I gotta believe, I gotta believe. I can't doubt, I can't doubt, I gotta believe. If I were to say to you, don't think about a white rabbit, what would you think about? The white rabbit, the thing you're trying not to. When we just say, God, this is in your hand. You care about me more than I care about myself. You have the power to hold me. You will hold me by your grace. And I can rel relax and rest and I can believe because he's the only thing worth believing in. Every one of us in this room has probably someone that we need to share and be honest with. I don't know what it is. Maybe it's not doubts for you, but whatever it may be, maybe it's somebody you need to make a confession to. Maybe it's somebody who, maybe you've brushed off and you need to hear their heart, but going to them and being able to be honest with them, whatever it is, be open to it. Number two, Guard your emotional well-being by grieving. Let me just see a show of hands. The last couple of years have been a difficult period of time in American history with COVID. How many of you know of a particular person, not you know somebody who, who has a relative, but you know someone who died from COVID? Would you just raise your hand? Okay, it's a lot of us. All right, there's been a lot of pain in these last few years. And grieving is something that we would rather not do. It's like touching the stove again. Who wants to do that? It's not gonna be any fun. We live in a painful world with a lot of pain and a lot of hurt. But our natural inclination is to take pain and to shove it down. It's kind of like that game whack-a-mole. You know, it pops up one area and you bop it down and then over here and you bop it down. It gets exhausting. It will drain you, but our natural inclination is to try to avoid it, to push it away. 
our burying tactics lose their effectiveness. Another image can be trying to hold a beach ball underwater. You can do it for a while, but eventually it's going to try to pop up and it'll likely hit you in the face. And it rises up at the most inopportune times when we're hungry, when we're tired, when we're stressed, when we're frustrated. That's when that pain will tend to rise up again in our lives. Jesus said in Matthew chapter five, verse four, blessed are those who mourn for they shall be comforted for they shall be comforted. The word, the Greek word that's used here for mourning, pentheo, it's, it's really talking about a general sense of mourning. It's not just about death. It's about a lot of different things. Blessed are those who mourn for they shall be comforted. Now, I ask myself this question, does everybody grieve? Does everybody mourn? And I would say the answer is no. I mean, if it was true that everybody did, why would Jesus waste his breath? But our natural inclination is to push it away, to push it down. We need to develop the capacity to face our pains. And it was the amazing insight of our savior who 2000 years ago shared something that psychologists nowadays are saying, yeah, it's important to deal with trauma. It's important to deal with our pain. If we don't deal with it, it will impact our lives. Some of us have probably grown up in family situations where we were told not to cry. And I believe that probably for many of those individuals, some of it was just the mindset that was present. Don't, don't deal with pain. Just look on the positive side, you know, raindrops on roses and whiskers on kittens type stuff. But I do think that probably for many who said, don't express your sadness, it was because they did not want to deal with their own pain that they were pushing down stuff. And if you see somebody crying, who does that remind you of? It reminds you of what you're not doing to deal with the stuff at that deeper level of your heart. And so many of us have just simply pushed our pain down. Now, when I first started out in the field of counseling, um, my, my perspective was if you change the way you think, you will change the way you feel. In fact, I think there's probably a good amount of <clears throat> biblical evidence to that idea. Isaiah 41.10 says, fear not, for I am with you. Do not be dismayed, for I am your God. The for I am with you is the truth that can keep me from being overwhelmed with fear. So we're told what to focus on, what to think about. 2 Corinthians 10.5 says, we destroy arguments in every lofty opinion raised against the knowledge of God and take every thought Cognition, another word for it. Take every thought captive to obey Christ. And so there's a lot of emphasis and truth that's there as far as if you change the way you think, you will likely feel different. But what I became aware of pretty quickly in my counseling career is that there was something else going on. It's not just simply about, okay, let me just focus in on this truth and that will change the way I feel. Real quickly, real simply, I don't get more complex than this because I can't understand it more complexly than this. Three parts of the brain. The brain stem keeps our hearts pumping, lungs breathing. Really good, none of us would be alive without it. The limbic system, it's that fight, flight, or freeze reaction. It's connected to the emotional brain center, the amygdala, very often a part of our, our anger system. But that fight, flight, or freeze reaction is often tied to an old wound that many times we have simply pushed down. The prefrontal cortex, that's the slower part of our brain. That's a part of our brain that really is able to analyze things. That's a part of your brain you want working the most, okay? You really don't want the limbic system in control because what happens when the limbic system is triggered? What happens to the blood that was going to your brain? 
It's going to other parts of your body. It's going to your hand, it's going to your feet. You need to do something to get safe is basically what happens when we experience the triggering of the limbic system. And it doesn't go to our brain. So when we have those old wounds that we push down, we're not in a place to really be able to think through, to process, to deal with in a situation in a wise way. Let me give you kind of an example. Um, let's say you're preaching and you preach a sermon, you preach the sermon on the parable of the prodigal son. And people are coming up to you afterwards and saying, pastor, thank you. Thank you so much. That was really important. That was really meaningful. That really spoke to my heart. And one guy comes up to you and says, oh, pastor, I, I really appreciate a number of the things you said. But when you were talking about um, the, the, the ability for that son to come back, I really disagreed with what, what, what you shared. And what's going on inside you at that point is a very strong possibility that there's going to be some emotions that rise up. I mean, who is this guy? You know, he's, he's questioning me. I've been to seminary. He hasn't. In fact, you might even react, you may overreact in that moment because of what's been said. But maybe it was a situation where you grew up in a home with a very critical parent, where anything you did was always questioned or told that it could have been better. So you have this kind of what I'll call a second degree burn. You have this hurt that's been there and it's maybe a long time ago, but you've pushed it down and you've been pretty successful at pushing it down. But at those inopportune times when something triggers it, those emotions rise up. Now, maybe you don't say anything to the guy. Maybe you just kind of smile and nod and inside you're burning up. But maybe when you get home, you get frustrated with your son or your daughter or your wife or your husband. And so it's easy in those moments to take out that frustration in a different way because there's an area that you have never dealt with you have never faced. Tomorrow I'm gonna to share a model, a visual model. I tend to be pretty visual, except when it comes to seeing that our garbage can is full. And I, I kind of lose it at that point. But it's a visual model to kind of see how some of those areas, what some of those wounds may be, and some of our protective measures are. And I wish I could say that grieving was a pain-free experience. I don't know about you, when I was young, this was many years ago, they probably have some better stuff that doesn't hurt. But when I was a kid, they had this stuff in this little vial, it was called mercurochrome. And it was really orange. And when I scratched my leg, I'd go to my mom, mom, I hurt my leg, and what did she do? She put some of that mercurochrome on. And that mercurochrome would sting, it would hurt. But what did it do? It protected the wound from having some type of infection. And so when we deal with pain in life, if we don't grieve it, if we just push it down, it will catch up with us at some particular point in time. Five different aspects or elements of grieving that I think are important to keep in mind. Number one, recognize the value of grief and pain. Bob Paul, who is one of the vice presidents at Focus on the Family of Hope Restored, a marriage ministry, shared one time about uh, a time when he was in college and there was a, I think it was a medical missionary, but it was a, somebody who was involved in missions who had worked at a prison colony in another country. And the man got up to the podium and said, thank God for pain. And Bob's thinking, what in the world is going on with this guy? And the man described a scenario where in this country, in this leper colony where he worked, that there was an individual with leprosy. And leprosy is a disease of the nerves. And so he didn't have feeling in his fingers. And one night or one morning, he woke up after sleeping that night and his finger was across the room. A rodent had eaten his finger off because he didn't have the capacity to feel pain. Pain tells us something important. It tells us we need to do something with it, not just bury it, not just avoid it, not just deny it. We need to face it and deal with it. Number two, identify what needs to be grieved. Make a list, even if it's a small list. And our natural inclination sometimes is to say, well, a lot of people had it worse than I did. And that's true. But whatever pain you feel, if it, if it 
measures on the Rector scale at all, it probably is something worth leaning into at least to some degree. Number three, create the time and space to grieve. If you don't create the time and space to grieve, it's not gonna happen. You won't do it, you'll ignore it, you'll avoid it. Make the time and space to be able to grieve. Number four, pursue it, do it. Maybe it's doing some journaling. Maybe it's meeting with a brother in Christ uh, that is maybe a mentor that you can share your heart with. Maybe it's working with a counselor. Maybe it's doing some reading. Maybe it's taking time in prayer on your knees before the Lord of, of facing those areas that you would rather not touch with a 10 foot pole. I remember a number of years ago, a person came into my counseling office and they said, Glenn, I hate coming to see you. I took it as a compliment because I knew what they were saying. They were saying, if I didn't come here and deal with this, I would not deal with this in any other manner. I would keep it buried. But you know, it was important for that person to face their pain. Number five, put it in perspective. Put it in perspective. Recognize that your life is more than pain. And if you don't, you will live your life as a victim. And victimization is not the way to live. I talked to many people, the phones on focus on the family, and I would say probably George has had the same experience, but where I probably talked about maybe 15 or 20 people who thought that theirs was the worst pain in the entire world. I mean, nobody could have any pain worse than this. But put it in perspective. Yeah, you need to grieve, but you also need to look at what is true beyond your pain. 2 Corinthians 6.10 says, sorrowful, but always rejoicing. Sorrowful, but always rejoicing. There's a passage in the Old Testament that I would say has probably become one of my two or three favorite verses in scripture as a counselor. It's found in the book of Lamentations. Lamentations chapter three, verses 16 through 24. And Jeremiah, who's understood to be the author of Lamentations, the scenario was this. Jerusalem had just been defeated by the Babylonians. So it's a war zone, not a pretty sight. And he's looking over the city of Jerusalem. And so speaking of God in verse 16, he says, he has made my teeth grind on gravel. I have forgotten what happiness is. So I say, gone is my hope and my glory. I mean, he's just leaning into the hurt. In verse 21, he says, but this I call to mind and therefore I have hope. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. Great is thy faithfulness. This sounds like two different individuals, two totally different people. It's the same person who's being honest with his pain and then looking at the truth beyond his pain. So let me ask you this, which one is biblical? They both are. They both are. They both have an important part in our life. In fact, I've been to a dentist's office more times in my life than I would like. But when a dentist is dealing with a cavity, there are basically two steps. You drill and then you fill. You drill out the decay and then you fill it with good enamel. There are two mistakes that can be made by the dentist. One is if they don't drill long enough, they get half, maybe even 99% of the decay out but they don't get it all out, what's gonna happen over time? It's gonna eat from the inside out. The other mistake that can be made is if they drill too long and then there's no tooth to fill. And some people never get out of spin cycle with their pain. So we need to be able to face it, but we also need to know when it's time to move forward and what to focus in on. We need to be able to put it in perspective. And this particular verse from scripture is a great segue into number three. Number three, guard your emotional well-being by being balanced, by being balanced. My wife says, I don't know if it's a threat or not, but she says, if I die before her on my tombstone, she's gonna have engraved the word balance. Now it's easy to ascribe to it. It's a lot harder to get it, all right? Um, and it's not, being balanced doesn't mean that we can't figure out what the truth is or that we're not willing to stand up for what we believe is right. But it means that scripture 
speaks to balance. And if you've read scripture over any period of time, you'll find things where there seems to be two different ideas. And you know what? They're both true. Both of them make sense. Both of them have an important place to play. I'm going to mention four today that I think are um, accurate as it relates to ministry, important for ministry. Number one, innocence and discernment. Innocence and discernment. Matthew 10, 16 says, Behold, I am sending you out as sheep in the midst of wolves. So be wise as serpents and innocent as doves. How many people would put a serpent and a dove in the same cage? Probably nobody, okay? And yet you and I are told to be both of them. In this particular passage, Jesus is saying, I'm sending you out for ministry and there will be wolves out there. There will be wolves out in the community and there will be wolves in your church. And I want you to be innocent as a dove. I want you to be wise as a serpent. There are extremes to either end. And usually the extremes are not constructive. On one end, there can be gullibility. You can be taken advantage of. You can be mistreated. You can be used up. You can be spit out. Even in ministry, maybe especially in ministry. And that can happen. That gullibility can, can be there. And it might be okay for a season. You might be okay for a while. But eventually... If that gullibility is there and there's not discernment, it will probably switch over to the other extreme. The other extreme is being cynical or cynicism. It was Dr. Samuel Johnson, an 18th century British poet and critic who said, human life is everywhere a state in which much is to be endured and little to be enjoyed. You're probably not gonna see that on any inspirational refrigerator magnets. But when you become cynical, when you're looking over your shoulder, when you're doubting your own motives and everybody else's, there's probably a cynicism that is going to dampen the effectiveness of the power of God in your life. And so we're told to be able to do both, to be innocent as a dove and to be wise as a serpent. The second balance point, grace and obedience. What better vocation than ministry to talk about the importance and the balance of grace and obedience. If you don't get it right in ministry, or excuse me, if you don't get it right personally, you probably won't get it right in your congregation. John 1 John 3, 1 says, see what kind of love the Father has given to us that we should be called children of God. And so we are. There's an abundant love that God has poured out on us. There's love that says, I love you just as you are, and I will grow you and I will mature you. And that love and that acceptance is what we were created for. We, 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 we love it. And yet, are we to accept that love and say, okay, since I'm loved that way, <laughs> let me do whatever I want? No. Romans 6.1 says, what shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin so grace may abound? By no means. By no means. You and I are called to holiness. This side of eternity, none of us will fully arrive. None of us will get there but it doesn't mean that it's not the mark that we aim for. I'm reminded of the uh, Olympic archery coach who was driving through the countryside and he saw these barns and there was a bullseye with an arrow right in the middle of it. He, he traveled, there were about five or six barns. He saw all of these. He's like, I got to find that person. I got to find out who this is. So he stopped in the nearest town. He said, hey, you know, there's a person who, there's bullseyes and they're, they're, they're getting, you know, they're getting bullseyes every shot. He said, who is the person? He said, oh, he's just up the road a bit. So he drives up the road and there's a guy with two paint cans, a red one and a white, white one, and he's drawing circles around this arrow that was stuck in a barn. Okay, not exactly what he'd hoped for. 
But it's real easy to justify our behavior based upon what we do. God wants us to pursue holiness and understand that his forgiveness is what we need when we fall short. So what are the extremes? On one end, you have license. There's no target, there's no aim. Many denominations, I believe, have fallen short here because they don't want to alienate anyone. They don't want anyone to feel bad. So everything is accepted. They don't want to ruffle any feathers. So the truth is not preached. I will often talk with parents who may have adult sons or daughters who are involved in, in a lifestyle or a sin behavior in their life and their adult children want their parents to approve of them. And I, I kind of use this analogy. I say, if you believe that your son or daughter was driving past your house and you believe that a half a mile ahead, the bridge was out, what would be the loving thing to do? Would it be to smile and wave? Or would it be to communicate the truth? And we can communicate the truth in love. But just simply smiling and waving, I don't believe is in anyone's best interest. The other end of the extreme is legalism. Legalism. It was Martin Luther who said this, two words. You want to make sure that you understand these because they could be really misunderstood. He said, sin boldly. He wasn't saying, oh, just sin. Shall we sin so grace may abound? Yeah, do it. What he was saying was, don't be so afraid of failing. Don't be so afraid of sinning that you're paralyzed. Remember in the story of the talents? There was one man who was given one and he said, I knew you to be a harsh master. So what did I do with my talent? I buried it. I was too afraid to lose it. Now, I don't know if that was a rationalization or if he really thought that, but that's what, what he said. And so if we're so afraid of being sinning that we're bound up in this fear of, oh no, I may fail. That's not what God would have for us. C.S. Lewis uses an analogy of a baby's first steps. I mean, when babies first walk, they're not the most secure. And a parent is thrilled with that child's first steps. But a parent would not be thrilled with that child staying in that particular state. The parent wants the child to be able to gain that healthy walk as the child grows and matures. So he uses this phrase. He says, content, but never satisfied. Content, but never satisfied. I want to grow. I want to become the man. I want to become the woman God wants me to be. And so as I yield to his spirit, as I yield to the power of God in my life, he will do it. There's a difference between acknowledging our shortcoming and camping out there. God wants us to acknowledge it. He wants us to understand the truth, but he also wants us to be able to move forward, to grow in our lives. Balance number three, service and self-care. Service and self-care. This is close to the last one of obedience and grace, but I think it's a little different because it speaks to the rhythm of action in our lives and the rhythm of rest. And there's a pendulum that tends to swing back and forth in time. There's a song by Robert Chisholm, you probably know it. It's called Living for Jesus. Living for Jesus, a life that is true. Striving to please him in all that I do. Yielding allegiance, glad-hearted and free. This is the pathway of blessing for me. And I believe that that's true. But I think some would have a concern about the striving and the doing that it talks about. But again, there's a balance. Are we called to live a life of obedience and good works? We absolutely are. Matthew 5, 16 says, in the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your father in heaven. Sometimes we tend to think of good works simply in a negative way. And they are, if that's our means to try to gain God's approval. No, but we were created for good works that we should walk in them. And that obedience to the Lord is what he would call in our lives. Mark, 16, Mark 6 verse 31 says, come away by yourselves to a desolate place and rest a while. Rest a while. That's the name of a cabin. Friends of ours gave 
to a cabin that they had up in New York State when they pulled away and gained some time of rest because they needed to see the importance of self-care, of self-care, of not running at a pace that they would not be able to continue, but caring well for themselves. And I think sometimes it's easy to look at that and to think, you know, if, if I care for myself, well, that's being selfish. No, kind of like with the oxygen mask that falls down in front of you, if the plane should, I never experienced it, but I heard him talk about it a lot on a plane. Should the cabin lose air pressure and oxygen mask will fall down, first put it on yourself and then you'll be in a good place to help others who may need the attention that they need. You can't run a marathon at a sprinter's pace. It was Vance Havner, a preacher from the age of 14. He preached for about 70 years. So I think he had some experience and he said, if you do not come apart, you will come apart. That will happen. You need to guard against it. You need to take the time to do that. 50 to 70 million Americans suffer with sleep deprivation each year. Some of them are people who have a hard time just getting asleep. Others are just too busy. They're just sleep deprived. And yet we need to see that caring for ourselves well is something that is important to God. Now, I don't know about you, but there may be some areas in your life where self-care is important. You need to be balanced. You need to take that time. You need to figure out how you can build rest into your system. And there may be different things that you can do in that regard. One of the areas, and I'm not a poster boy when it comes to this area, is just the whole area of diet. I happen to believe that there are gonna be Cheetos in heaven, okay? So I'm probably not the one to talk about diet. But they will be redeemed Cheetos. Uh, they won't stain your fingers orange, okay? But there will be Cheetos in heaven. But diet or exercise, exercise is important. Your body needs that, that exercise to, to stay in a good place. I probably do a little bit better with the exercise than I do with the diet thing. My wife would probably agree with that. Um, but when it comes to exercise, I remember as a kid, I would read these, I like football. I won't tell you the team I root for because nobody would listen, you'd all get up and leave. But um, the, every year there would be an annual about you know, the preseason and it would have a description of each team. And in the back of it, there would be this ad, it would be about Charles Atlas, and it was kind of in cartoon form, and there would be two individuals in the ad. There would be uh, Charles Atlas who had these big, big muscles and there would be this skinny guy who was getting sand kicked in his face. And so I, didn't, I, I never paid money for the Charles Atlas, whatever it was, I'm not even sure what it was, but I would go downstairs in our basement. Uh, my brothers had a weightlifting set. So I would, get I would get energized and I would start and I'd probably do about a 45 minute exercise routine. And I wanted to do it three times a week. I never got past two weeks because I started too big. I started with too much exercise. If you start small and you build on it, you will be able to do it. And now I, I, I used to run, I don't run, but I do elliptical. Um, and now if I don't do it, I kind of like, you know, boy, part of me is missing. So exercise, an important part of that healthy self-care. So in the name of exercise, and you guys have been sitting for a long time and I'm not done yet, but what I'd like you to do is stand up. I'd like you to raise your arms. I'd like you to, if you can, maybe you need a doctor's note first to tilt your neck, but just stretch for a minute. Exercise. God's given us bodies and he wants our bodies to be used for his honor and his glory. And exercising can be an important part of that. Okay, one more stretch. All right. And you can sit down. Tim Sanford is a colleague of George and mine at Focus on the Family. He's the clinical director of the counseling department. And he's written a couple books, two that might be of, of interest to you. One is called, it's, it's, in, it's written for children of pastors. And it's called, I Have to Be Perfect and Other Parsonage Heresies. 
okay? Um, good book, a lot of good things in there. Um, he's also written a book, he's written several books, but another one of the books that he wrote is called Losing Control and Liking It. It deals with parenting as your kids move into their teen years and realizing that losing some of the control is really a good thing. It's a helpful thing. But in his book, Losing Control and Liking It, he shares a ownership versus control grid. And that's what you see before us. So above the right side is what I can't control. Above the left side is what I can control. So with a show of hands, how many of you think there's more that I can control? Any hands, any takers? How many believe there's more of what I can't control? Okay, yeah, absolutely. There's more people. There's a lot more of others than myself. So there's more of what I can't control. Now, some people own and some people don't own. So these four quadrants, the upper left is owning what you can control. It's a pretty good place to be. You're taking responsibility for your life. If you make a mistake, you confess it to the Lord, to someone else, you set healthy boundaries. Upper left is a really good place to be. Lower left, not owning what you can control, not so good, okay? Uh, you're not taking responsibility. It reminds me of Tom Sawyer when he was being punished and he was given the task of whitewashing the fence. What did he do? He kind of manipulated a group of other kids to whitewash the fence for him. So he wasn't taking responsibility. He was involved in some manipulation, so to speak. The upper right, owning what you can't control. This is where many times we get into trouble because we're taking responsibility for something that's not ours. And what we can end up doing many times is we can end up trying to manipulate. Not because we don't see a situation clearly, we may see it pretty clearly, but we're manipulating to get someone to do what we think. And again, many times what that other person should be doing. But there's manipulation involved in it. And there's a lot of stress. There's a lot of anxiety. There's a lot of depression in that upper right quadrant. The lower right, not owning what you can't control, that's a pretty good place to be. We'll talk about that just a little bit more. And we'll talk about it in light of three scenarios that theoretically could take place in any of the congregations that you're at. Drew Smith, he got fired from his job because he was tardy because of a substance abuse problem that he had. Don and Lisa, a couple, married couple, who are arguing constantly, are struggling, and each one blaming the other for uh, things in, going wrong in their life. And Deacon Jones, I mean, not the Deacon Jones, your Deacon Jones, a person in your congregation started to pilfer the collection box. What do these three all have in common? They're not owning what they can control. They're not taking the steps and getting the help that they need. And so if there's a pastor or staff person, it's real easy for that person to be in the upper right, to be in the upper right. They hired, they hired Drew to do odd jobs at their house, even they don't, though they don't have the money for it. The staff person decides, okay, I'm gonna meet with Don and Lisa three times a week, even though they're not spending time at home with their wife and children. And they're experiencing a strong level of guilt, even though there were no red flags about Deacon Jones. And there was a system set up to safeguard against the potential of somebody having a problem. But what a person does is they take it and they put it on themselves, and the plate gets fuller and fuller and fuller. Those are three examples. If you don't learn to say no, there'll be six, there'll be nine, there'll be 12, there'll be 24. They'll add up because you need to be able to not own what you can't control. So how do you get to a place of moving to the lower right? First off, you realize what you can do. You can be responsible in some way for what is yours. You can pray for them. You can delegate 
And one of the things you can do is if there's somebody who's struggling with something in your congregation, feel free to give them 1-800-A-FAMILY to call if they would like to speak with a counselor, pastoral counselor, they can. I'm not saying 20, 30 minutes on a phone is going to resolve everything, but it might be a meaningful start for them. Delegating is an important thing. And serving in some way. There may be something that you do have a place and a part but it's also important to realize you're probably going to still feel the impact of ministry pain. It, I'm not saying because you're not responsible for it, that it's not going to affect you in any way. When people make choices in their lives, it can be painful. It can hurt, but you need to realize that it's not yours to control, ultimately release the outcome to God. God cares about the person. He cares about Drew. He cares about Don and Lisa. He cares about Deacon Jones even more than you can. He cares about them. And there needs to be a godly, oh well, in not owning what you can't control. Now there's an oh well in another one of the quadrants. There's an oh well in the left side of not owning what you can control. Oh well. But the oh well on the right side is the realization that this is not mine to fix. In the book of Luke, Luke chapter four, there's a scene where Jesus is preaching in the synagogue and some of the people who are listening to him are pretty excited. They're pretty delighted with what he's sharing, at least in the beginning. And then it kind of changes a little bit and they're not so happy with what he says. And it says, Jesus got up and went away. In the story of the rich young ruler, after Jesus was talking with him, it said the rich young ruler went away. And what did Jesus do? Hey, wait, wait, wait. No, no, no. There's more to be said. Jesus let him go. Gary Thomas, a pastor in Texas, has identified at least 24 times where Jesus either walked away or he let the other person walk away. There are times where that, oh, well, is a reasonable thing to do. So what are the extremes with service and self-care? One extreme is perfectionism. If I get it perfect, then God will love me more. I've got to be a better pastor. I've got to be a better youth leader. I've got to be a better administrator. Now, I'm not saying don't grow. Again, we talked about content but never satisfied. But if I have to do that because I need more of God's love, folks, you're not going to get it that way. Perfectionism is a trap. Recently, I was reading in the book of Galatians. And in Galatians, Paul talks about, you started by faith. Why are you now coming up with this whole thing? Circumcision was kind of the the key issue there in the book of Galatians. Some of the uh, individuals wanted the new converts, the Gentiles who came to Christ to kind of accept circumcision. And I think it's kind of, I don't know, it seems somewhat masochistic for an adult who was maybe circumcised at eight years of age to want other men to experience circumcision. It just doesn't seem right to me. But that tendency for perfectionism to be there On the other end is self-absorption, self-absorption. And you probably will convince yourself because you probably, if you're on that end, you probably will want to do that, but you probably won't be able to convince anybody else that you're doing the right thing. There needs to be the balance of service and self-care. The fourth balance point, the natural and the supernatural. Now, in the particular passage I'm pointing to here, they're right next to each other. Sometimes you find one verse in you know, John and you find another verse in Matthew or in the Psalms, whatever, different places. But here, the balance points are right in the same chapter. Psalm 19, verses one through two. The heavens declare the glory of God and the skies above proclaims his handiwork. Day to day pour forth speech and night to night reveals knowledge. God's creation, God's general revelation, which anyone can see, if you believe in God or not, you can see what has been created is there. There is the natural order of what God has made. 
But following these verses, following verse six, that's just spoken about the natural creation, supernatural and the fact that it was created, but what God has created being natural. Psalm 19 verse seven says, the law of the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. God's word and his spirit can lead us and communicate things to us that we would never get from just simply looking at his creation. So his creation plays an important part. It's biblical, but his word is there too. And there are two particular areas where I think um, uh, these often come into play. And I just want to mention being a part as church leaders, pastors, being a part here of the Assembly of God Church, you take very seriously the supernatural power of God, that God desires to heal, that God desires to build up the body through his spirit. And that is important. That needs to be done. I think there are probably a lot of denominations who can learn tons from what the Assembly of God stands on in that regard. But there are two areas here that are important to keep in mind. One relates to healing. God can and does choose to heal, but God may bring ultimate healing to a person even if he chooses not to heal a person physically. I remember in college, I went to a Christian college and a professor of mine was talking about, I don't remember many of my college classes, but this was one I do. And I remember him talking about praying in protest, praying for what we desire, praying our heart before the Lord and asking God to bring healing in a person's life. And that's something that's important for us to do. But it's also important to keep in mind, we need to let God be God and who he is. We're also... God has made me and you a natural and a supernatural being. And I think sometimes there's this unnecessary tension between professional counseling and biblical counseling. Professional counseling looks at some of the dynamics, some of the ways that God has created his order. And that's important to realize that he's created an order. But it's also important to realize that that order never fully brings a person to saving faith. Biblical counseling is important as well. And I love the opportunity that that I have at Focus on the Family and many times in my private practice to be able to bring professional counseling and biblical counseling together because both of them have an important part. In fact, I would say one of the most important things for biblical counseling, if we're talking about pastoral counseling, is the appropriate place of church discipline. Uh, You know, probably if you're like me, you'd rather not ever touch it with a 10 foot pole. I mean, who wants to do that? You get accused of being holier than thou, all kinds of things. But scripture speaks to some of those things that are true, even though they are uncomfortable. God has made us a natural and a supernatural being. So what are the extremes? This was a little bit harder to identify, just a real clear opposite. On one end of the spectrum, you have just a worldly worldview. There's no power of God. There's nothing where God is showing himself in our lives. It's just what anybody else would look at and believe. That's one end of the spectrum. On the other hand, I kind of use the word unapproachable Because if you're only focused on the supernatural, you're probably not going to be able to hear individuals' hurts and heartaches and concerns. You're probably going to be trying to encourage them to just simply pray more or do something more in that regard. It was Oliver Wendell Holmes. He's not a theologian. In fact, he was an agnostic. But he did say this. He said, some people are so heavenly minded that they're no earthly good. Now, Being an agnostic, uh, again, I'm not supporting his theology, but even broken clocks are right twice a day. So I think there was some level of truth there that we can keep in mind. So how do we deal with, how do we come up with a level of balance in our lives? First step is to recognize the importance of each part. 
to look for in scripture? What are those balance points that are important to keep in mind? Number two, to identify where you are and any imbalances that are present. Take an inventory. Where am I? Do I lean this way? Do I lean that way in regards to that balance? How do I be balanced in each of these areas? Number three, be intentional without losing the current emphasis you have. It's real easy to go from here all the way over to here. But you want to be balanced in who you are. I love the fact that Calvary chapels require their pastors to preach all of scripture. So it's easy, it's hard to camp out on one particular end. They preach the balance in that regard. And number four, be aware of polarization. Be aware of polarization. Let's say for instance, you've been in ministry for 30, 40 years and maybe you've become a little bit more cynical. You know, this isn't gonna work. People aren't gonna follow through. God's not gonna do this. You know, you're just more cynical. And maybe there's a newbie on your staff who's, they're all in. I mean, they're excited. They're ready to go. So one person is more towards maybe the, the gullible end. The other is a little bit more towards the cynical end. Over time, what's likely to happen? Why? Because each person is trying to counterbalance what they perceive to be the imbalance in the other person. And so you need to learn from the newbie, the excitement, the joy. And the newbie needs to learn from somebody who's been in ministry for a long period of time. You may never get right here, but you probably are gonna get closer than you would otherwise. So learning from one another and realize that polarization is something that's gonna happen. The old fashioned sinks, they would have two faucets. They'd have a hot water faucet, they'd have a cold water faucet. And if you washed your hand, you'd either freeze or fry your hand depending upon which faucet you put your hand under. We're missing something. They also had a plug that would go in the drain and it would plug it up so you put the hot water on, the cold water on and the water would blend. You would get the balance there. And so often we need to look for what is that balance? How can I be balanced in what God has communicated through his word? Number four, guarding your emotional well-being by developing healthy relationships, healthy friendships, people who are gonna be there in our lives, healthy marriages, putting the time in to build and strengthen. I'm probably gonna speak very shortly on this, briefly because tomorrow I'm speaking on building a marital legacy in your family as well as in your church community. But the healthiest relationship that ever existed is a relationship between three people, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. God's perfect balance. And from that, we're created in his image. We are created for a relationship as well. And relationship begins even before birth, in the womb, the connection that mom and dad have with that child is meaningful and important. There was a study that was done in Romania. Harvard researchers and Tiffany Field from the University of Miami School of Medicine. And they studied Romanian orphanages and the children that were in those. Now, probably there was some degree of maybe not quite as much food as others would have, but really the largest factor that came into play was the lack of relational connection. And so the study that was done, the results that came about is they found that was below, the children were below average in weight, in height, in mental acuity, and presence of blank and non-smiling faces. Relationship means something. It's important. The quality of marriage is so meaningful for well-being in ministry. I, as a counselor, as a marriage family therapist, I talk with people who are struggling many times in their relationship. And I'm so thankful to be able to come home to my bride because she's an encouragement to me. And when we go through difficulties, having somebody that you know is gonna be there by your side is so important. There's what I refer to as the tire test. For the tire test, you need a couple of things. You need a house that has a two-car garage, 
and you need two cars and you need at least one remote control. And here's the tire test. When I come home and I drive into the driveway and I click that remote control, the first thing I see is what? The presence or the absence of the tires on the other side of where I'm parking. And the presence of those tires mean my wife is home. The absence of those is she's not. What is the first emotional feeling you have when you see that those tires are there or those tires are absent? That will tell you a lot about where your relationship is. The tire test. And if you're single, the importance of developing relationships spiritually, emotionally, mentally, and physically. Who are your lifetime friends? Who are the people that are gonna be there over the course of, of, of your life and their life. I mentioned the couple, I didn't mention them by name, but the couple who had a cabin up in New York called Rest A While. And right now, my friend Walt recently was diagnosed with stage four prostate cancer. So I would like right now, just for us to take a second, I'd love to have you join me in prayer for Walt Van Beers. He's a dear brother in Christ. When we get together, we laugh, we talk, we eat, we have a wonderful time together. His wife is Connie, my wife Elizabeth, we, we get together. He's 84, I think he's a Pat Boone wannabe. He, he plays tennis, still at age 84, but only the Lord can heal him. And I'd like to ask you to just pray with me right now for Walt Van Beers. Lord, we bring Walt before you He's a dear brother in Christ. You know what he means to his family. You know the pain that he's been through in his own life, losing a daughter in a car accident, losing a son-in-law in a car accident. And I pray that by the power of your spirit, you will bring healing in his body. Lord, we pray that the uh, efforts of the doctors would be effective. Lord, you use medicine. You, lose, you use miracles. We just pray that whatever steps you desire to take, that you would bring healing in Walt's body. We bring him before you. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray, amen. <clears throat> the impact of physical touch. Physical touch activates receptor sites under your skin. They signal the vagus nerve, which lowers one's heart rate one's blood pressure, it decreases the stress hormone cortisol, and it increases serotonin, which reduces depression. Do we need touch? Absolutely. Does it need to be healthy? Absolutely. Do there need to be boundaries? Yes. But touch is so important. And I think one of the things, particularly individuals who are single, I have a, I have a young son who um, is somewhere on the spectrum. He's still in our home. He's looking for a place. We almost, uh, he almost had a condo recently, but very high functioning autism. But one of the things that I do is I, I give him back rubs. I, I touch him because as a single young man, he doesn't get a lot of touch in a lot of ways. And so touch is really important. It needs to be healthy, there need to be boundaries, but we need touch in human relationships. I wanna just share a real quick balance point as it relates to human relationships. And that is, there is a natural and a supernatural element to the way God designed us. Matthew 5, verse 46 says, for if you love those who love you, what reward do you have? Do not even the tax collectors do the same. Now, Jesus is not saying it's a bad thing when you respond well because someone else responds well to you. As a counselor, I try to encourage people to encourage each other towards good actions. It's not a bad thing, but it doesn't go far enough. We're told John 15, verse 13, greater love has no one than this, than someone laid down his life for his friends. It was before Jesus died that he shared this with his disciples. There's a supernatural love that's important. You may have been wondering what's this hourglass doing up here? This hourglass represents 60 minutes of time. And let's compare that 60 minutes of time to 60 minutes of forgiveness. And so in any particular relationship, you have those 60 minutes, whatever the offenses are, that you can choose to forgive. But if at the end of those 60 minutes, that's it, the relationship is done. 
What we need is the supernatural power of God to say, no, when that 60 minutes of up is up, we're turning it over again and again and again. That forgiveness is something that our God has called us to in following him in that relationship of love and obedience. Finally, number five, guard your emotional well-being by exhibiting sexual integrity. There's probably not one area that is more destructive to the body of Christ, a person's own life and their family than when there's a lack of sexual integrity. Now, I want to be careful with statistics because I realize sometimes a statistic can be thrown out and it gets quoted again. I am going to throw one out. Josh McDowell has shared this one. um, So it's pretty good standing, but I don't know if it's exaggerated or not. But what he says is it was found in a particular study that 57% of pastors say they struggle with pornography. In another study of uh, churched men and churched women, it said that 60 to 72% of church men struggle with pornography, 24 to 30% of church women. Again, I don't know if it's true, but whatever it is, it's way too high and it's way too destructive and it does damage to the body of Christ. There are three steps to create sexual integrity. One is to cultivate your marital life, including your sexual life. Make it so that your marriage is something that a person doesn't want to stray from in any way. There are sexual killers, eight of them here. Fatigue. Fatigue will destroy a sexual relationship in marriage. If you only have those last vestiges of emotional and physical energy at the end of the day, that's going to be pretty destructive. Put on your calendar time to spend together. Distractions. Any distractions that can happen in ministry (laughs) or from ministry? Absolutely. Boredom. Not being creative in your relationship. No emotional foreplay especially for a woman, that, that importance of knowing. The word in scripture for sex in the, in the Hebrew is the word to know. And if you're not sharing your heart, there's not a connecting, there's not a bonding. Resentments that can take place in the marriage relationship, those resentments need to be dealt with. Early life traumas that may factor into some of the struggles that couples may deal with. Probably most notably sexual abuse. But it can be other areas of two of trauma in a person's life, which can factor into difficulties. Pornography will kill a marriage relationship, a sexual relationship. And as we all get older, medical issues can rear their ugly heads. But seeking to keep your relationship strong. And you might say, well, it takes two. And that's absolutely true. It takes the husband and wife to work at their relationship. But working to grow and putting that time and effort and energy into it. One of Focus on the Family's great resources for uh, couples is Hope Restored. It's a marriage intensive. And I remember speaking to a pastor probably about five, six months ago. He and his wife went to Hope Restored. And he said to me, he said, Glenn, had we not gone to Hope Restored, we would not be married today. That their relationship would have ended. I don't know if it would have or not, but that was his surmising understanding of the situation. Keep an eight by 10 picture of your wife or your husband or the two of you or of your family in your office. Safeguard your marriage relationship. Dave Carter, who has been on Focus on the Family a number of times, is a counseling pastor. He was a pastor at Chuck Swindoll's church in Southern California. And Dave Carter, um, when he first got into ministry, he was a youth pastor. And so in youth ministry, um, there was a senior pastor who had left and gone with a woman. And so he finally tracked down the pastor. He spoke with the pastor for two hours and the pastor didn't come back. That started an effort in his part to really try to understand what the struggle was with sexual integrity or the lack thereof. And so he has shared uh, that Two years of stress will be, in a sense, the emotional setup for an affair. Two years of stress. And there certainly is stress in ministry that can take place. 
Number two, know your vulnerabilities. Proverbs 16, 18 says, pride goes before destruction and a haughty spirit before the fall. Realize that you are vulnerable. Anyone is. This was one of um, those areas where it's important to recognize what are your vulnerabilities. Maybe identify. Maybe it's when you're traveling. Maybe it's when you're tired. Whatever it is. Maybe it's when you have your cell phone. Whatever it is, find out your vulnerabilities because that's important to do. Not going to take time to go through these. I'm just going to highlight a few of these. But Dave Carter came up with 19 different kind of steps, per se, as far as people falling prey to infidelity or some type of sexual immorality in some way. And here's the things. I, actually, let, me, let me just read them. I'll go through them real quick. You save topics to discuss with your friend. You share struggles related to your spouse with your friend. The friend begins to share his or her relational struggles with you. Now there's reciprocity there. You anticipate seeing the friend. You compare your spouse to the friend with your spouse not quite measuring up. You buy special small treats for your friend. Not anything really expensive, just small ones. You are more concerned with your friend's well-being than your spouse's. You check in with your friend. How did you rest last night? things of that nature. You fantasize what marriage would be like with the friend. You begin spending time with your friend. You spend money on the friend without your spouse knowing. Now it gets to be the amount goes a little bit higher. You begin to argue with your spouse about the friend because your spouse is concerned about the time you're spending. You might begin to lie in order to spend time with the friend. You might accuse your spouse of being jealous. You hide interactions with your spouse to spend time with the friend. You develop special rituals with the friend like meeting at the water fountain. Your, fr your friend shares feelings or touches that impact you. There is sexual content in conversations, maybe just in joking. You have corporate dates. Number 20, it's one that I added. You voice your feeling to your friend in an apologetic way. Oh, I shouldn't be feeling this way, but here's what's going on. I, I, I'm, I'm attracted to you and I, I know I really shouldn't. That's like pouring gasoline on a fire and it's gonna create a problem. Number three, have your accountability set up. It needs to be somebody who will be both tough and tender. Somebody who can communicate and ask you the tough questions, but has the heart of Christ, is not gonna condemn you. There's a difference between primary accountability and what I call secondary accountability. Primary accountability is somebody of the same gender as you, same sex as you, who is going to ask you on a regular basis, whatever that is, could be weekly, could be monthly, could be every other week, but it needs to be clear who is contacting who. It could be by telephone, could be by face. I usually suggest if you can do it by face once a month, that's probably pretty good. Secondary accountability is the fact if there's a line that you have drawn and communicated in your marriage, either spouse, if you step over that line, you need to be honest with your spouse and tell your spouse the truth. That's secondary accountability. A lot of times, men want their wives to be their accountability partner. You know, wives make good wives, they don't make good mothers, okay? So you need to keep it. Now, I'm not saying there never could be the question, how is it going? But there's a difference between asking for intimacy, you're asking that question, as far as the intimacy of your relationship and when it's really more checking up to see how they're doing. That's really more the accountability and that's better for there to be another person. But if you do step across that line, you need to be honest with your spouse. I remember a, a time, this was back in New Jersey years ago, and I was counseling a young woman and I was noticing that I was thinking about this young woman more than I should have. And so I decided I was gonna tell my wife, secondary accountability. Now, I picked a really bad day to do it. It was my wife's birthday. <laughs> Note to self, don't do that. But I'll tell you one thing, when I shared that with her, what happened to my feelings? They ended. That openness, that, that communication, that honesty with her just ended those feelings for this other woman. And so being transparent, that secondary accountability is important. Dave Carter did a study, this was some years ago, back in 88 through 98, a study of 4,000 pastors. And what they found was 20% of pastors acknowledged that they had been involved in some type of sexually indiscreet relationship while in ministry. Now you might say, well, that's a long time ago. 
What is it today? If anything, it's higher, unfortunately. But the importance of having that accountability set up. So five ways to have, to, to safeguard your well-being in ministry. Through honesty, by grieving, learning to grieve. If you've never learned to do it before, it's an important part of your life. By being balanced, looking for those extremes, those things that we may go to one end or the other. Developing healthy relationships and having, exhibiting sexual integrity. But you're doing this not simply for your own well-being. You're doing this not only for your family, your spouse, you're doing this for the body of Christ. And ultimately, it's for God. I wanna leave you with one final quote. It's from a sermon that was preached many years ago, back in 1941. C.S. Lewis, his sermon called The Weight of Glory. Just to set it up here, he was talking about people who would either be with God in heaven or be apart from God in hell. So when, he, when I get to the point, you'll, you'll understand. It's a serious thing to live in a society of possible gods and goddesses. To remember that the dullest, most uninteresting person you can talk to may one day be a creature, which if you saw it now, you would be strongly tempted to worship or else a horror and a corruption such as you now meet, if at all, only in a nightmare. All day long, we are in some degree helping each other to one or the other of these destinations. It is in the light of these overwhelming possibilities. It is with the awe and circumspection proper to them that we should conduct all our dealings with one another, all friendships, all loves, all play, all politics. There are no ordinary people. You have never talked to a mere mortal. Nations, cultures, arts, civilization, these are mortal and their life is to ours as a life of a gnat. But it is immortals whom we joke with, work with, marry, snub and exploit. Immortal horrors or everlasting splendors. Let me pray with you as we finish. Lord, thank you for what you have placed in each of our lives as opportunities for ministry. Lord, to have an impact by the power of your spirit in people's lives, that people can be drawn to a saving faith, that people can be empowered by your spirit to live a life that transforms them and transforms others around them. Lord, we do pray that our safeguarding of our well-being would be something that you empower. Lord, whatever those areas are in our lives that we may need to identify, that we may need to step out in faith and act upon, Lord, give us grace today to identify what those are, what those transformative changes will be so that we can be light to a world that needs you above all else. We ask this in the precious name of Christ our Savior. Amen. Wow. How many of you wish you could just watch that back? Amen. <laughs> Glenn, thank you so much. Um, just coming and speaking to pastors and, and uh, we, we need to be healthy. Everything in this culture is trying to tear us down. Isn't that true? So thank you uh, for today. Glenn will be back tomorrow. Uh, I got to tell you, like, this is free counseling. How many of you figured that out? <laughs> like, this is the time to milk Glenn dry. All right. <laughs> Uh, we'll see you tonight at 7 o'clock is service. We had a wonderful pre time in the Lord's presence uh, last night. We're looking forward Amen. to more great things today. So God bless you, and we'll see you back tonight. Amen.
What we don't do 